I'm going to start with a couple questions that I want you all to answer today. Uh, the first question is, uh, in God's future, some say in heaven, uh, will there be hungry people? No? Okay. In God's future, in, in the time to come, heaven, however you want to define what is before us, will there be violence? No? No? In God's future, in heaven, in the time to come, uh, will there be people that are lonely? No? How do you know? As the Word tells us so, how do you know? Faith. 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 Um, God's revelation, which is the Bible. Word of God. Um, Hmm. We've been told the story. We uh, we read the, the text. But even more than that, the way we know is that God reveals God's future to us in What's the easiest Sunday school answer you can give? Jesus, Jesus right? You know, we get caught up trying to figure out the mysteries in the text about what God's future is going to be like for us. And God revealed that future to us in Jesus. Jesus. Wow, you all get it now, right? Loving Jesus. You're going to get it right almost every time, right? God reveals God's future to us in Jesus. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to be with us. God in flesh, right? And everything we need to know about who God is what God is like, and what God's future is going to be like, we can experience in Jesus. Jesus. He's the re revelation, the fullness of God in flesh. Uh, and he sets the pattern for us. Think about Jesus his life, his death, and his resurrection. Everything about Jesus and everything that Jesus shares with us is about hope and liberation and healing and peace and life, abundant life. When Jesus walked the earth and he went from town to town and he shared this good news of God's kingdom breaking through, that's an important element, by the way. Is that a lot of times we look at Jesus as if he just walked around as some great miracle worker. Like he went to town and he was just healing people and feeding people and all that kind of stuff. But that wasn't Jesus' purpose. As a matter of fact, in the book of Mark, Jesus is constantly telling people that have had this experience with him to not tell anybody about it. He'd heal somebody uh, of sickness, and then he'd turn to them and he'd say, listen, keep this a secret. Don't tell anybody about it. Those, those moments in that text are known as the secrecy motifs, and a lot of people are wondering, why would Jesus say that? Because Jesus didn't want people's attention to get shifted from the purpose. Sure, he healed people. He liberated people. He fed thousands, right? But his purpose, and he says it over and over and over again throughout the gospel, is to proclaim the good news of the, the kingdom. The kingdom. What we find in that is that the fullness of the kingdom has come to us in Jesus. So you can use Jesus and the kingdom together because they are the same thing. So what Jesus is sharing when he comes into those towns is he's sharing the fullness of the kingdom. And you know what the fullness of the kingdom is about? It's about everything that you all shared at the beginning in my questions. A life no longer bound by sin and brokenness. A life that is liberated and set free from worry and burden and loneliness. A life liberated from oppression to disease and sickness. A life to live abundantly in relation with others, not out of hostility or violence towards the other, but to be a people who are united in peace. Everything we see in Jesus is exactly a representation of the future that we will have together in Christ. Amen? And today, on All Saints Sunday, here some of you are wearing white. I know I'm not wearing white. I've got a white school. Okay. Is we're celebrating all of those who've gone before us, who are now alive in Christ in God's future. Glory be to God that they are experiencing that fullness. And while we might focus on the future, the message for us today is that we shouldn't all be just looking towards the future. <laughs> that we need to embrace 
God's future in the present. The here and the now. That's the work of God's church. That's the work of God's people. We're supposed to take on the very characteristics of Christ in the present moment. We're supposed to be a people who live the present future. When people look at God's church, God's people, you and me as disciples and followers of Christ, they should see nuggets of Jesus in us. They should be able to point to us and say, wow, look at those peacemakers. They're living a completely different kind of life than the way of the world. Look at those people who are willing to humble themselves and serve each other. What kind of life is that? You see, when we read the gospel text today, and we actually experience the Beatitudes, which, by the way, is Jesus' beginning of his primary teaching, the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7 is known as the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' primary teaching. And he begins right off the bat with the Beatitudes. His disciples gather around him, which, by the way, when, when it's mentioned that his disciples gather around him, they're not just talking about the twelve. There are hundreds of people gathering around, interested in what Jesus has to say and what Jesus has to offer. You see, word of this awesome, wonderful guy has been spreading all across the countryside, and people want to find out what is going on and what he's really all about, and so they come to hear and so Jesus is in this teaching moment. Um, we're people who kind of want to know what the end is going to be about, right? You don't believe me, people are making lots of money off of books, writing about how it's all going to end. Matter of fact, we also get caught up when we read stories about people who return from the afterlife, don't we? I mean, there's all kinds of books out there about, I saw God, I saw my family, and it kind of brings us comfort because we want to know, we want to have some assurance that the story that we've all been invited into might have some truth, you know? We want to know that that life that is to come is going to be like the life that Jesus had to offer, that there will be no more weeping, no more mourning, uh, that there will be peace, that there will be healing and wholeness in the life to come. And I think that's human. We all want to know. We all want to know. But sometimes we can get so focused on wanting to know about the future that we forget about the relationship God has called us to in the present. And so when Jesus sits down with his disciples on that mountain and he begins to preach, he starts right off the bat with the Beatitudes. And he talks about these folks who are blessed. Now I know in my own life, I don't know about you, but when I've read the Beatitudes in chapter 5, blessed are the hungry, blessed are the humble, Blessed are the merciful, blessed are the peacemakers. A lot of times I've viewed those as if they were conditions. And what I mean by that is that I, I read it and I think, well, if I'm peaceful, then I might be called a child of God. Get it? The condition? Or, or if I'm humble, I might be able to see the kingdom of heaven. Uh, that there's like these conditional response within the attitudes, but I don't think that was Jesus' intent. I think what Jesus is sharing in that moment is he's actually turning the world upside down right there and then. He's setting a new precedent. He's giving the people gathered that day a new name. Each and every one of them that gathered before him that day are considered blessed. Blessed. So the people who are there that day represent each and every aspect of those he shares in the Beatitudes. The hopeless. The hungry, those who mourn, those who feel lost and abandoned, those who are merciful, those who are peaceful, those who are being persecuted. They're all there in front of him. And with each and every one of them, what name does he give them? Blessed. He's reminding them that they might find themselves in this present moment burdened by the things of the world. But the good news is that God's kingdom is available for them in the here and now. In other words, what Jesus is sharing with the people that day is they don't have to wait for it anymore. They can step into the blessing because Jesus is calling them out. And in whatever situation they find themselves in life, which stands in opposition to the successful patterns of the world. Think about that a minute. When Jesus goes through the Beatitudes, hopeless, hungry, mourning, are those types of people considered to be successful in the ways of the world? I mean, you got to remember, Jesus is talking to a predominantly Roman audience, right? I mean, it's the Roman world. What standards of success existed in the Roman world? You all know? Power, same as today. 
conquest, security, financial wealth, you, you name it. Those were the standards for success in the world. And Jesus starts out by saying, guess what? All of you who have not been defined as successful in the world, I'm giving you a new name today. You no longer need to worry. Because God's kingdom has come, is breaking through, and you can live abundantly in that kingdom here today. You no longer need to be defined by the brokenness and the darkness of the world. You are now defined as a child of God. And those who stepped into that relationship found a new breath and a new way to live. They became children of the new creation. And they continued to follow Jesus around. Did they get it all right all the time? No. But they began to pattern their lives in such a way that the definition, the word, the promise that was offered to them by Jesus that day began to resonate in such a way that they became an embodiment of that good news through their own lives. Think about the disciples, the 12 disciples in particular, who are a part of this great feast that we celebrate today, the great cloud of witnesses, that after experiencing Jesus, their whole lives were transformed in such a way that they were able to give of themselves, even for most of them, unto death. Because they no longer were going to play the games of the world, but to embrace the love of God, even if it meant giving their own lives for it. The strength that they found in that was partially because they were embracing the future hope that was already set before them. In other words, they knew the end of the story. Death could not hold him. Three days, resurrection life, new creation, new beginning, new hope. The fullness of kingdom is before us, and you and I have been invited to embody the fullness of the kingdom today. And so I think that's a challenge to the church, to be honest. It's a challenge to me. Because if I'm able to say, what is the kingdom of heaven like? Well, there won't be any violence in the kingdom of heaven. There won't be any hungry people in the kingdom of heaven. There won't be any lonely people in the kingdom of heaven. Why are we waiting? Start living it now. That's our work. It's not to connect ourselves with the systems and the powers of the world. Jesus is inviting us and has given us a new name. Each and every one of us are blessed. And each and every one of us can live into the fullness of this kingdom life here and now. One way I, I became aware of this idea of present future. In other words, I know the hopeful future that we have before us in God's, God's future before us. I, I know it because I know who Jesus is. I can experience it through his life, death, and resurrection. I know, I know the joys that are to come, and praise God for that. But I also know how I can share the joys in the life today. That I can receive the name that God has given us. Even though we haven't stepped into the fullness, we can be a part of the present future right now. Not fully realized, people can see glimpses of that hopeful future in our own lives. I, I became aware of this when a friend of mine in college named Shedrick Grimsley, who was a fraternity brother of mine, who grew up in the black church uh, in Lakeland, Florida, used to always call me Reverend Terry. Uh, now this is when we were in undergraduate school and I was not ordained yet. I was a religion major. And I knew that God had called me to be a pastor, but I didn't have the credentials. But every time I'd see Shedrick, he'd always say, Reverend Terry, good to see you. And I was like, Shedrick, please stop calling me Reverend Terry. I'm not a reverend yet. And then I said, please stop calling me Reverend Terry when we're out of parties, please. <laughs> <laughs> because nothing turns people away like Reverend Terry. <laughs> I'm trying to meet some young ladies. Come on, let's get but everywhere you go, Reverend Terry, Reverend Terry, uh, I went to actually worship with Shedrick at his church in Lakeland, Florida, and let me tell you, that was a worship service, all right? Uh, four and a half hours long. Some of you are visiting today, you're like, oh my gosh, we're going to go way past an hour. <laughs> we might run 15 minutes over. Oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Four and a half hours in the black church, and that's a short service, all right? 
And it's spirit-led in the way that it's a call response. It's not just one person standing up there preaching. The whole congregation's involved in this kind of worship experience. And, and they usually have some really great musicians that are good at that kind of spontaneity and, and uh, free-form worship. And so the organ's going the whole time. It kind of sets the back, the tone, you know, to the service. And, and occasionally Shedrick would be invited to preach. A man Shedrick would preach. He'd get up to the pulpit. He'd pound the pulpit. And, and he would speak. And they called it hooping, you know, where you get that rhythm, you know. The Lord Jesus Christ came. He died for us. Amen, amen. And then there's this good stuff. He'd be marching across the state. It was good. It was full of energy. And when I realized that it, when they were gathering that service, everybody was calling each other brother or blessed or child of God. And so they were naming each other and calling them out. He used to call me Reverend Terry, I think, maybe because he knew that's what God's plan was for me. He wanted me to live the future now. Now, I got greater clarity on that later when I was at Divinity School. When I took a class with Samuel Proctor, who happened to be one of the greatest black preachers in our country, in the history of our country. Uh, he was a preacher at Abyssinian Baptist Church in New York City, and he could preach. Well, let me just tell you something about Samuel Proctor. He never looked you in the eye when he was preaching. He didn't walk around. He didn't hoop like Chevy. What he'd do is he'd go up in the pulpit. He'd put his manuscript down. He'd put his elbows on the pulpit, and he would read straight off the manuscript. But he would read with such passion and conviction that he would draw you right into the story. It was like you were right there. You could taste it, smell it, feel it. And by the time he got done, man, you were just blown away. People come to the altar. You know, it was such a good sermon. That was Samuel Proctor. And I took a class with Samuel Proctor, and he was talking about the black church traditions. And one day he said that growing up in the black church in a predominantly minority community, after coming through great trials and tribulations, especially through civil rights and all these different, looking for greater equity in the midst of the world, that within the black church tradition, whenever a young person felt called to something that would make a difference in the world, the whole congregation would go ahead and give them that title. So if a young person wanted to be a doctor and help heal people, they'd start calling them Dr. John or Dr. Sue. When somebody felt called to be a pastor, they would give them that title. They'd call them Reverend Terry. You see, they didn't wait. They didn't wait for a cat. They didn't wait for the fullness of the kingdom. They went ahead and identified it in the people's lives then and there. In that present moment, embodying good news in their very life, even though they hadn't been through college or seminary yet. Just acknowledging that God is doing a good work in their lives and that they are blessed. Blessed. So why are we waiting? Why are we? Why aren't we becoming peacemakers now? Are we eating the hungry now? Are we meeting our neighbors now? Because that's the work of all the saints. And guess what? That's your name too. All of you are saints. For the glory of God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.